So mathematicians have a ton of proofs that there are infinitely many primes. And today I'd like to look at two of them that are kind of new to me. Well, one of them has a flavor of something that we've done on the channel before, but it's presented a little bit differently. And then the other one is brand new to me at least. And it comes from this paper that I recently found. Okay, so for our first method, we're gonna consider this function that I'll call f. And what it does is it takes a natural number n and it gives you the number of prime divisors of n. So let's explore how this works. So let's observe that f of 45, for instance, will be equal to two. And that's because 45 is equal to three squared times five. So three and five are the only prime divisors of 45. But if we were to look at something like, oh, I don't know, f of 30, we would get three. And that's because 30 is equal to two times three times five. So it has three prime divisors. Now, let's observe that f of one is equal to zero, and that's because no prime divides the number one. Okay, so now that we've got an idea of how this function works, we're ready to launch into the meat of the proof, and this proof uh, goes via a proof by contradiction like many, many proofs that there are infinitely many primes. Okay, so now, by way of contradiction, let's suppose that there are finitely many primes, and let's call them P1, P2, all the way up to P sub capital N. So this number capital N is the number of primes that we're having here. And now let's observe the following, and I think this is pretty clear, and that is that a prime, we'll call that prime PI, divides the number n. In other words, n is a multiple of pi if and only if we have pi divides n plus capital P. So that's a capital P where capital P is simply equal to the product of all of these primes. So the thing is, is if you have finitely many primes, you can just take their product. Okay, so let's see, like I said, little n is a multiple of pi, if and only if, little n plus capital P is a multiple of pi. But then this equivalence right here is the same thing as saying that f of n is equal to f of n plus our capital P. Again, if a prime divides n, it's gotta divide n plus p and vice versa, but that means if we count up the number of primes dividing n, it has to be exactly equal to the number of primes dividing n plus p. In fact, it's not just the same number of primes, it's exactly the same set of primes. But now we're pretty much home free. Let's observe that f of one is equal to zero as we previously discussed. But then that's the same thing as f of one plus p. So f of one plus p is equal to zero, but that means that no primes divide the number one plus p, which is problematic because this number one plus p is strictly bigger than one. And by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which I guess I should say we're assuming here, we know that one plus p should be able to be expressed as the product of primes. But this right here is saying that it cannot be expressed as the product of primes. So that's of course our contradiction. Contradicting this assumption up here that there were only finitely many primes, meaning there are infinitely many primes. Okay, so now that we've looked at this method, I wanna look at one more proof that there are infinitely many primes. Thanks for sticking around this long into the video. If you're enjoying the video, make sure and give it a thumbs up, and if you haven't yet subscribed, consider subscribing. It really helps us out around here. Okay, so our next proof of the infinitude of primes is a probabilistic proof. So let's start with the following fact, and that is, the probability that a number x is a multiple of a natural number k is equal to one over k. 
So let's just think about that carefully. So how many multiples of two are there? Well, every other number is a multiple of two. In other words, half of all of the natural numbers are multiples of two. Meaning if we choose a natural number at random, there's a one half chance that it's a multiple of two. Or every third number is a multiple of three. Meaning that if we choose a natural number at random, there's a one third chance that it's a multiple of three and so on and so forth. So this is just the generalization or the general version of that statement. But now let's observe the following extension of that. And that is the probability that X is a multiple of P to the N, but not P to the N plus one will be one over P to the N minus one over P to the N plus one. So there's the probability that it's a multiple of P to the N and then we're subtracting off the probability that's a multiple of p to the n plus one. This is how you would do that because necessarily if it's a multiple of p to the n plus one, it's automatically a multiple of p to the n. So it wouldn't go like a straight subtraction here, except for in the case when our not condition is completely contained within the condition that we're assuming. Okay. So anyway, we can simplify this a little bit, and that's gonna be equal to, let's see, p minus one over p to the n plus one. Okay, nice. Now we're ready to launch into our proof, which again will be done via contradiction. So by way of contradiction, we have finitely many primes, p1, p2, all the way up to p sub n. So that capital N is again the number of primes that we have. All right, and next up what I wanna do is fix a natural number which I'll call little n. But since there are finitely many primes, we know that we can write it as a product of these primes with certain exponents. And so it's gonna be equal to p sub one to the r sub one times p sub two to the r sub two all the way up to p sub capital N uh, to the r sub capital N. And that's going to be with this ri numbers bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, great. So that's our fixed number. So that means that all of those r's have also been fixed. Okay, so now let's observe that if we have x, a random natural number, then actually x is built out of these primes with random exponents. So in other words, x is equal to p1 to the power t1 all the way up to p sub n to the power t sub n with these ti bigger than or equal to zero randomly chosen. Great, so that's like our random variable here is broken into, well, really capital N random variables. And now let's observe that uh, the probability that our random x is equal to n is gonna be equal to the probability that our t1 is equal to r1 times the probability that our t2 is equal to r2 all the way up to times the probability that t sub capital N equals r sub capital N because these two numbers are the same if and only if all of those exponents are the same. Okay, now what can we do with that? Well, let's notice that T1 is equal to R1 is the same thing as saying that X is a multiple of P sub one to the R sub one, but not P sub one to the R sub one plus one. It's exactly this condition right here. And then that goes the same for just these different subscripts over here. So that means this is gonna be equal to P sub one minus one over P sub one to the R one plus one by again, this calculation we did right here. And then that's gonna be times P sub two minus one over P sub two to the R two plus one all the way down to P sub N minus one over P sub N to the R sub N plus one. So we've got something like that. But now let's rewrite that a little bit nicer. Notice that's the same thing as the product as I goes from one to capital N 
of P sub I minus one over P sub I to the R I plus one. Now, next up, I wanna take that product and break it into two products. So I'm gonna write this as the product as I goes from one to N of one over P sub I to the R sub I. So there I'm factoring out all those P I to the R I terms from the denominator. And then here I've got the product as I goes from one to capital N of P I minus one over P I. That's what's left over there. But now I'd like to observe that this first bit right here is equal to one over N. And that's because notice that in the denominator there, we're essentially taking this product P1 to the R1 times P2 to the R2 all the way up to Pn to the Rn. It's just like I said in the denominator. So instead of giving us N, it's gonna give us one over N. And then after that, we've got what is actually just a constant. So let's notice that that does not depend on the number lowercase n that we started with. So I'm going to break that or I'm going to push all of that together into a number that I'll call capital A. And now since things are getting a little bit messy here, I'll summarize what we have shown on this board right here in this green box. And that is that the probability that x is equal to n is in fact equal to a constant that we've called a over little n. Okay, so now let's take that bit of information and see how we can finish everything up. Before we finish off the proof, I'd like to tell you about my second channel, Math Major, where we have lectures for full courses in upper division math classes. And in fact, that entire channel is ad free, thanks to my support on Patreon and channel memberships. If you'd like to help out, maybe consider becoming a patron or joining our channel memberships. Although there's no pressure to do so. Okay, so let's finish off this proof. So far what we've done is proven that a randomly chosen natural number is equal to a fixed natural number n is equal to a over n where a is a constant. Now I'd like to observe that if we take the sum over all natural numbers, so in other words the sum as n goes from one to infinity, of the probability that x is equal to n, we should get one. And that's because we're adding up the probabilities of all possibilities. And anytime you add up the probability of all possibilities, you should get one. But let's observe that that's also equal to the sum as n goes from one to infinity of this capital A over n based off of the calculation that we did before. But that's gonna be equal to A times the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n. But that's a constant actually a positive constant, we didn't point that out, but that constant was positive from the previous calculation, times the harmonic series. But we know that the harmonic series diverges infinitely, so this is in fact infinity. But obviously we've created something that doesn't make any sense. We have one on one side of the equation, and we have infinity on the other side of the equation. But like I said, that doesn't make any sense, meaning we have reached a contradiction. Contradicting that assumption that we had at the beginning that there were finitely many primes, which means again, there must not be finitely many primes. In other words, there are infinitely many primes. And that's a good place to stop.